Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video from the Dr. Craig Videos channel. This one is the first of a two-part series that asks the question, did Jesus rise from the dead? Part one is called The Facts. Part two is the explanation, so I feel like part one is going to be something akin to the Habermas minimal facts argument, where it just lays out some details that most historians generally agree on, well, part two is going to be looking at alternate explanations for those facts, and dismissing them as somehow less plausible than a guy actually coming back from the dead. I could be wrong about these guesses, but we'll just have to get into the videos in order to find out. Let's go! Why was Jesus of Nazareth crucified? Because he made outrageous claims about himself. Realistically, there's not enough reliable information to know for sure what charges Pilate would have had him executed for, but there are a couple of details that might give us a clue. The first is that Pilate was notorious for doing things specifically to piss off the Jewish population, to the point where the emperor had to keep ordering him back into line before eventually removing him from office. The second is that about 30 years prior to the events of the Gospels, the then governor of Syria, Publius Quinctilius Varus, had about 2,000 Jews crucified for being involved in a revolt that resulted from certain messianic teachings. So given the fairly recent event involving a messianic cult revolting against Roman authorities, and Pilate's disdain for the Jewish people in general, it's not surprising that a Jewish man who was seen as leading a messianic cult would be sentenced by Pilate to crucifixion. Of course, this doesn't really fit with the reasoning presented in the Bible, with Pilate being a kind of pathetic sniveling figure who's afraid of the Jewish religious authorities, but at the end of the day, the way I see it, it was most likely the messianic teachings of Jesus that got him nixed. He claimed to be the one and only Son of God. Eh, debatable. As you allude to later in this video yourself, the common Jewish messianic idea at the time wasn't really about a divine son of God coming down to sacrifice himself so that humans could go to heaven, it was about winning a military victory over an opposing force. I mean, just look at the messianic prophecies that some of the gospel authors tried to tie to Jesus, like Micah chapter 5. Verse 2 gets misquoted to say that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, but when read in context, this is very explicitly about a guy being born into the clan of Bethlehem Ephrathah, who will become a military ruler of Israel that will successfully kick out the Assyrians. So if Jesus was talking about himself as the Messiah, he most likely would not have been calling himself the Son of God. In fact, if he were billing himself as the son of God, then that would have given the chief priests all that they needed to just stone him to death right then and there, no Romans or crucifixion necessary. Why would anyone take his claim seriously? I don't think it's that Pilate was taking his claim seriously. If anything, it would be more about how seriously his followers were taking his claim, given the tendency towards rebellion found in sects of that nature. Well, that all depends. If Jesus actually rose from the dead, then his claim to be God's unique son carries considerable weight. Well, at least this time they didn't claim that rising from the dead in and of itself proves that claim, as apologists usually do, usually forgetting all about all the other non-divine non-sons of God that have been raised from the dead in the Bible. On the other hand, if the resurrection never actually happened, then Jesus may be safely dismissed as just another interesting but tragic historical figure. Would we say dismissed? Like, whether or not the guy even existed in the first place, it is undeniable that he had an immense impact on cultures all over the world throughout the last 2,000 years. Did Jesus rise from the dead? As we explore this question, we need to address two further questions. What are the facts that require explanation? And which explanation best accounts for these facts? And it looks like my prediction at the beginning is vindicated. Yay? There are three main facts that need to be explained. The discovery of Jesus' empty tomb, the appearances of Jesus alive after his death, and the disciples' belief that Jesus rose from the dead. Only one of those would I consider to be a fact in the historical sense, and that would be fact three though I feel like we will have some very serious disagreements about what exactly is meant by the disciples' belief here. No doubt you'll be trotting out some version of the they wouldn't die for a lie argument, which is not a fact in the historical sense, not by any stretch of the imagination. 
In fact, two might slip in, depending on some pedantry about what you mean by appearances, but there is still so little evidence for the empty tomb, or even a tomb burial in the first place, that I would not admit that one is one of the facts that needs explaining, and neither would Gary Habermas, the main proponent of the minimal facts argument, of which this seems to be a version. Let's examine each of these. Fact number one. The discovery that Jesus' tomb was empty is reported in no less than six independent sources. Six, you say? Really? You call that six independent sources? Matthew and Luke copied copious amounts of their text from Mark, so they obviously were not independent by any definition of the word independent. Acts was written by the same author as Luke, so to call Acts independent of Luke is just ridiculous on its face. John clearly had access to the other Gospels, though he didn't blatantly copy them as Matthew and Luke did to Mark, so this one is ambiguous and depends on what you mean by independent. If you mean that he was unaware of the other documents and so was writing without any knowledge of their contents to influence him, then John is not independent. If you mean he didn't copy from those other documents, then we could consider John to be independent. So being generous here, these six independent sources are, at most, three independent sources, Mark, John, and 1 Corinthians. More realistically, we should be ditching John and it's actually two, Mark and 1 Corinthians. But wait, there's more! 1 Corinthians never mentions a tomb, much less an empty one. It simply says that he was buried and then raised. It makes no mention of the manner of burial. That would be consistent with what happened to most crucifixion victims. After they'd been hanging on their crosses for a bit, they'd either be thrown into a mass grave or into an individual unmarked grave. Also keep in mind, this fact is called the discovery of Jesus' empty tomb. 1 Corinthians, even if we assume that the word buried is referring to a tomb, it makes no mention of the discovery of an empty tomb, just that he was buried and then rose. The empty tomb is an added assumption in this passage. This is actually an early Christian creed, and this creed would actually be fully compatible with the idea that Jesus' resurrection was a spiritual one rather than a physical one. Given the language here, his tomb or grave could still be full of his earthly body. So now we've dropped down to one independent source for the empty tomb. That is significantly less impressive than six. And some of these are among the earliest materials to be found in the New Testament. Okay, it's hard to pin down from this graph exactly when they think the Gospels were written. It looks like it fits the general scholarly consensus, so I'm not going to pick that apart too much. But do they really think that Acts was written before Luke? Acts is Luke's sequel, picking up the story where Luke ends off. They were likely written one right after the other. This is important because when an event is recorded by two or more unconnected sources, historians' confidence that the event actually happened increases. Okay, so John is definitely not independent from the other Gospels in that sense. They definitely were connected. So here we have confirmed that, given the connections of the different documents mentioned earlier, and the lack of mention of any tomb, much less an empty one in 1 Corinthians, we only have one single independent source for the empty tomb. So what does that do to our confidence that the event actually happened? Hint, it makes it go down. And the earlier these sources are dated, the higher their confidence. And the very earliest source is the one that does not mention anything more than a burial. Doesn't mention a tomb, doesn't mention an empty tomb, doesn't even mention an empty grave. Just a burial, and then he's back in either corporeal or non-corporeal form. It's not specific about that. Moreover, the Gospels indicate that it was women who first discovered that Jesus' body was missing. Yes. It was the woman's job to do the preparations on dead bodies at the time, so they had women doing women's work. It would have been odd for them to have had men doing that work. It would be like writing a piece of fiction that is set during World War I and having a platoon in a battle of all women soldiers. Now, certainly there were women who fought in battles in World War I, but they were very much an oddity. Most women serving in the military at that time acted in support positions like phone, telegraph, and radio operators, ambulance drivers, pharmacists, munitions assemblers, and jobs like that. So to have a whole platoon of women in a battle situation would strain credulity, to say the least. Same thing here. We see women where women would be expected in the story. This is likely historical, because in that culture, a woman's testimony was considered next to worthless. 
A woman's testimony in a court of law, maybe, but we're not talking about law here, are we? We're talking about a story that is initially purely told orally between friends. Are we to believe that women had no influence on what stories people told each other? Did they tell no stories of their own to each other? There aren't really very many sources that attest to this either way, but if we look at the New Testament books, we often see women playing fairly prominent roles. In a modern view, Paul's writings on women is very outdated and overly restrictive, but at the time it was actually a little bit on the progressive side. With Paul even spending the opening of a chapter of Romans dedicated to thanking a bunch of people by name, many of whom were women. The Gospels record Jesus as treating women with more respect than was expected, often surprising the Pharisees with his leniency. All this to say that women discovering the tomb fits in perfectly with the story, including the perceived extra importance of them being the ones to discover the tomb. Though notably in the earliest manuscripts of Mark, the women run off without telling anybody anything, which would seem to heavily imply that Mark was a work of fiction, because how would the author of Mark have come by the information about what happened to the women at the tomb if they just ran off without telling anyone? The same goes for other details, like Jesus' private conversation with Pilate and his activity in Gethsemane while everybody was asleep. And then we get to Luke, who has the women run and tell the men, but the men don't believe them, because they're women, and women are untrustworthy. And in John, the women tell the men, and the men rush out to verify it for themselves. So it's not like the only accounts of the empty tomb come to us exclusively from women, even if we take the most simplistic approach and assume that the Gospels were written by the guys whose names are on them, which they absolutely were not. A later legend or fabrication would have had men make this discovery. Why? How would having men doing women's work make the story more believable? Our confidence in the empty tomb is further increased by the response of the Jewish authorities. When they heard the report that the tomb was found empty, they said that Jesus' followers had stolen his body. Remember that thing earlier about becoming more certain that an event is historical when we find it in multiple independent sources? Yeah, well, this one can only be found in one source, the book of Matthew. And it is, again, one of those parts of the story where the purported author of the story would have had no way of knowing any details about the conversation that reveals this. And not only that, but the details don't even make sense, at least not with the picture of the tomb that is usually painted with a Roman guard standing watch over it. Though I will point out that this video is from William Lane Craig's channel, and he is the main apologist that puts forth the idea that the guard at the tomb was actually a temple guard rather than a Roman guard, in order to make sense out of the guards reporting to the chief priests instead of to the Roman authorities when the body went missing, and their apparent willingness to spread a lie about them falling asleep at their posts, something that most apologists will go out of their way to point out was something that carried the death sentence for Roman guards. Now, that said, I actually think that there was a rumor going around that the disciples stole the body. Maybe not rumor, but I could see that being an easy response when people are presented with the idea of an empty tomb. The story of the guard in Matthew reads as an apologetic response to that accusation. It seems designed specifically to counter that exact claim, and it even mentions that the Jews are still saying this to this day. And William Lane Craig agrees with me on this. To quote him from his article on the guard at the tomb, the story serves an apologetic purpose, the refutation of the allegation that the disciples had themselves stolen Jesus' body and thus faked his resurrection. Behind the story as Matthew tells it seems to lie a tradition history of Jewish and Christian polemic, a developing pattern of assertion and counter-assertion. He and I just disagree about whether that part of the story was completely fabricated for this purpose, or whether it had its basis in fact. It seems to me that an anonymous author writing several decades after the event would have had no way of knowing what transpired between the guards and the chief priests, and given that this is the first time any story of the guards at the tomb makes its appearance, and that appearance serves a very specific apologetic purpose, the obvious conclusion here is that the story of the guards was developed in the Mathean community of early Christians as an explanation for how we know the body wasn't just stolen. Thereby admitting that Jesus' tomb was, in fact, empty. The priests and guards, in the story of the empty tomb and nowhere else, admit that the tomb was empty. If you had a source from the priests themselves making this claim, and preferably also confirming the bribing of the guards to keep the secret, then that would be something. 
but an admission that the tomb was empty from the priests as described in the same book making the claim that the tomb is empty in the first place shouldn't really count as the priests actually admitting that the tomb is empty, especially given that there was no way the author of Matthew could have even known the details about this conversation. Most scholars by far hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. Okay, it's confession time. Normally, if I know that there's a video that I'm responding to that has been covered by other people, I will avoid watching their videos until I'm done with mine. Apologia responded to this one a while ago, and I did watch it then, but it's far enough back that I'm confident that I'm not just going to be regurgitating what Paul already said about it, but this quote just had me flummoxed. So I checked Paul's video to see what he found, and the reason this quote had me flummoxed is because it's a misquote. In Dr. Craig's book, Reasonable Faith, he gives the proper quote, most exegetes by far hold to the reliability of biblical statements about the empty tomb. That is a very different statement, as an exegete is someone who is concerned with the culture and the experiences of the people in the time and place that the text was written. Basically, they're trying to get into the headspace of the author when they were writing it, and this is not the same as the historian's job of trying to determine which parts of the book are accurate and which are embellished or even outright falsities. The exegete is often not concerned with the literal truth of the text, but mainly with what the author was trying to get across to us by writing the text. Now, often there is some crossover between historians and exegetes, as figuring out what the author intended to get across with their work can help us put the historical puzzle together, but this is not necessarily the case. And I'd actually really like to know the context of the original quote, but unfortunately, in the many places where this quote is used to support the historicity of the empty tomb, only one that I found actually mentioned what book it was found in, and unfortunately that seems to be a German book for which I cannot find an English translation. Now, immediately after this quote in his written materials, Craig does go on to use Gary Habermas' list of 2200 New Testament scholars, an alleged 75% of which accept the empty tomb as historical fact, a shockingly low number considering how many New Testament scholars are by believing Christians themselves. Craig uses us to support the idea that the empty tomb is an historical fact. But as long as I've already stolen from Paul for this part of the video, I may as well go all the way and point out that there's a paper that Habermas published in 2012 where he says, quote, but I have never counted the empty tomb as a minimal fact. It is very obvious that it does not enjoy the near unanimity of scholarship. From the very beginning of my research, I have been very clear about this. So William Lane Craig wanted to overstate the case for the empty tomb, and whichever staffer put this video together wanted to overstate Craig's overstating of the case for the empty tomb. Fact number two. The appearances of Jesus alive after his death. The alleged appearances. I don't have a problem with the idea that at least one or two of the disciples really thought they saw Jesus alive, but to just say that the appearances themselves are factual is assuming the conclusion. In one of the earliest letters in the New Testament, Paul provides a list of witnesses to Jesus' resurrection appearances. Bet you it's the creed from 1 Corinthians 15. He appeared to Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Finally, he appeared also to me. Yep, that sure is the creed from 1 Corinthians. It's not original to Paul, and Paul says as much in the opening, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. I'm passing this information that I got from someone else on to you. So it's an unsourced creed, a creed being a statement of belief. There is no hint that any of the named people actually confirmed any of it. There are 500 anonymous people. And then you get to add your own name to the end. This is the first century equivalent of somebody told me that somebody told them that these people saw Jesus. It's not very convincing, to say the least. Sure, some people probably did have visions of some kind that they were convinced were Jesus, otherwise the religion likely wouldn't have gotten started, but any information regarding such visions is incredibly scarce. The only actual account of any of these visions that we get is Paul's Road to Damascus vision. And that's it. That is the entirety of the reliable accounts of encounters with the risen Jesus. Furthermore, various resurrection appearances of Jesus are independently confirmed by the Gospel accounts. Again, to reiterate, the Gospels are not independent of each other, not by any stretch of the imagination, except for John, if we're being generous. 
And on top of that, the appearances of Jesus in the Gospel accounts are anything but confirmation. They are so contradictory as to be mutually exclusive. In Mark, depending on which ending we're going with, he either just appears to the women, assuming that the unnamed young man at the tomb was actually Jesus, before the women run away and then never say another word about it, the end. Or else he appears to two disciples who were out and about before popping in on the rest of them during a meal, yelling at them for not believing the first two, and then giving the Great Commission before immediately ascending into heaven. In Matthew, he tells them to go to Galilee, they go to Galilee, he meets them again there, gives them the Great Commission, and doesn't ascend into heaven, instead saying that he'll be with them until the end of the age. Though it certainly doesn't say that he'll be with them in bodily form, so I guess the ascension can be assumed here? In Luke, he plays dress-up or something to trick two disciples into not recognizing him before revealing himself to them and then disappearing. And then when they run back to Jerusalem, he appears to the rest of the disciples as they are eating, and again to emphasize they are in Jerusalem at this point, which doesn't really fit in well with them returning to Galilee before he would appear to them in the other account. Though, that detail aside, I could see this as just being a more detailed retelling of the two disciples that he already appeared to in Mark. Anyway, in Luke he does the Ascension thing, but in the sequel it gets a bit of a recap and mentions that he stayed with them for 40 days, which is quite a bit longer than the single meal he was with them for in Mark. John has an extended story, with Jesus touring the countryside and doing so many signs and miracles that the whole world could not contain a book that listed them all. And surprisingly there was no Ascension in John. He does make one of the disciples immortal, though. I imagine that was another apologetic response, this time responding to the idea that Jesus would return before all of the original disciples generation died. So as long as there's one immortal disciple, then he doesn't have to come back anytime soon. On the basis of Paul's testimony alone, Virtually all historical scholars agree that various individuals and groups experienced appearances of Jesus alive after his death. Did you not notice your inconsistency here? Let's replay a bit of their video to see if we can catch it. So earlier, they said, This is important because when an event is recorded by two or more unconnected sources, historians' confidence that the event actually happened increases. And now, they're saying, On the basis of Paul's testimony alone, virtually all historical scholars agree that various individuals and groups experienced appearances of Jesus alive after his death. So, earlier in the video, you pointed out that more sources at least roughly equates to more certainty that the event in question actually happened. And now you're saying that all scholars agree that post-mortem appearances of Jesus actually happened on the basis of one single source? Should their confidence have not gone down when we see that there is only one source for this information? I mean, to be fair, Paul is why I grant at least a couple of appearances, because he is a primary source for one of them, and I think that a similar event with one of the other disciples would likely have been needed to kickstart the religion in the first place, but I am fully aware that this does not amount to much more than speculation. So what makes these scholars so certain that these appearances are all genuine when the evidence for them barely amounts to anything? It may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Man, if I had a dollar for every time this quote has been trotted out in support of the resurrection. Well, ordinarily I'd go the normal route and point out that experiences involving seeing, hearing, or sometimes even interacting with a deceased loved one are fairly commonplace, often accompanied by a feeling that the deceased loved one is no longer dead. But this time, I will instead bring up the fact that when Professor Ludeman started pointing out that somewhere around 95% of the content surrounding what Jesus said or did showed signs of being exaggerated or even just made up out of whole cloth, the religious university that he was working at tried to force him to resign. In his defense, he published a paper on the decline of academic theology at his institution, in which he discussed the fact that faith derived from the biblical message had become impossible for him, stating, This is so not only because its points of reference, above all that of the resurrection of Jesus, have proved invalid, but also because the person of Jesus himself becomes insufficient as a foundation of faith once most of the New Testament statements about him have proved to be later interpretations by the community. So the dude agrees that some guys might have had experiences that they thought were the risen Jesus, but is also of the opinion that 95% of the stuff said about Jesus in the Bible is inaccurate. 
Fact number three. The disciples' belief in the resurrection. I don't really think this is in doubt. It essentially amounts to Christians believed the central tenet of Christianity. I've never understood why people think this is a big deal. After Jesus' crucifixion, his followers were devastated, demoralized, and hiding in fear for their lives. As Jews, they had no concept of a Messiah who would be executed by his enemies, much less come back to life. Well, I guess there go all those prophecies in the Old Testament that apologists like to trot out as explaining so clearly and obviously what would happen to Jesus. Good job? The only resurrection Jews believed in was a universal event on Judgment Day after the end of the world. And if you actually read the New Testament, that is the same thing that is laid out in most of the apocalyptic scenarios. At the Judgment, everyone comes back to life and gets to go to either heaven or hell at that point. Until then, they're all just waiting in some sort of limbo. Not an individual event within history. To say that the Jews had no concept of individual resurrections happening in their history is to ignore the Old Testament. There are several resurrections in there that are individual events. Elijah and Elisha both raised kids by lying down on their corpses in the creepiest possible way. And then after Elisha died, some random guy got chucked into his grave for some reason, and when his body touched Elisha's bones, he came back to life. So individual resurrections are not without precedent, even if the group resurrection at the end is still the expectation for most people. Moreover, in Jewish law, Jesus' crucifixion as a criminal meant that he was literally under God's curse. Yet somehow, despite all of this, the disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe that God had raised Jesus from the dead. I'm curious how you came to know how sincere these beliefs were. I assume that when you refer to disciples here, you're talking about the original Twelve minus Judas? Because none of those guys wrote anything or even gave any interviews that we know of. We don't know what happened to any of them after Jesus died, except for a couple of very brief mentions of Peter that can be found in Paul's writings, and another very brief mention that James the brother of John was killed by Herod. Now, we can probably reconstruct from what we see in Paul's writings that Peter was interested in keeping Jewish customs and traditions alive within the new church, so I suppose I can grant the sincerity of Peter's beliefs for argument's sake, but James just gets a passing mention of being executed, we don't learn about his beliefs or how sincere they might or might not have been, we don't even get the reason for his execution, much less any hint that he could have avoided execution by recanting his beliefs, and that's it. The rest of the disciples just completely disappeared from reliable history pretty much as soon as Jesus died. And yet, with this complete scarcity of any information on anything about the disciples, you somehow feel comfortable claiming that they all had sincere beliefs in the resurrection? They were so completely convinced that, when threatened with death, not one of them recanted. Again, how do you know this? Is it from all those apocryphal books that were written much later than anything else and which aren't used as a basis for any historical information except for that which apologists find convenient? It's from those apocryphal books, isn't it? Well, until someone explains to me why we should accept those details about the martyrdom of the disciples, but not anything else from those books, I'm just going to go ahead and dismiss them as unreliable sources, since for everything that doesn't have obvious theological motivations behind it, we agree that they are unreliable. Even the Pharisee Paul, who persecuted Christians, suddenly became a Christian himself. Yup. He had a vision that he describes in a way that is consistent with hallucination, and then he changed his mind about something. This is not the first nor the last time in history that somebody changed their minds about something after hallucinating as did Jesus' skeptical younger brother, James. Honestly, I feel like the James thing is more damning than supporting. Jesus had at least four brothers, and he only managed to convince one of them that he was telling the truth? The last we heard from the other three, none of them believed in him. The people that knew him best throughout his whole life thought he was full of shit, even when he could come back from the dead to convince them. Now, if I were to want to put forward the idea that his resurrection was actually faked rather than just the result of wishful thinking, superstition, and hallucination, I might be inclined to suggest that James, as the brother of Jesus, could very well have physically resembled Jesus, possibly even well enough to pass as Jesus himself in a pinch. Some sort of powerful, transformative experience is required to generate the sort of movement earliest Christianity was. Maybe. 
But ask anyone who has tried magic mushrooms, and I'm sure you'll hear all about the powerful transformative experience that results from those hallucinations. The experience itself need not be real to be powerful and transformative. And by real here, I mean corresponding to reality rather than just really experienced. That is why, as an historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. I mean, obviously the Christian scholars believe Christian explanations for things. That seems kind of unremarkable, especially given how much trouble Ludeman had for publicly espousing a view that ran contrary to his religious university's mission statement, and how many Christian scholars work at institutions with similar mission statements and statements of faith. These three firmly established facts cry out for an adequate explanation. To rephrase, these three weakly established possibilities don't really require an explanation. But even so, many explanations exist that are infinitely more plausible than an actual resurrection. Down through history, various naturalistic explanations have been offered to explain away these facts. The conspiracy hypothesis, the apparent death hypothesis, the hallucination hypothesis, and so on. All of these have been nearly universally rejected. And when you look at contemporary New Testament scholarship, do you know what you find? Almost universally, it's Christians working for Christian institutions. Do you know who has not universally rejected all of those options? The scholars who work in the field who are not beholden to statements of faith or mission statements. Now, does this mean that we can just dismiss all the work being done by Christian scholars or scholars working at Christian institutions? No, of course not. But it does mean that we should consider the potential biases that are sneaking into their work here. By contemporary scholarship, the simple fact is that there is just no plausible naturalistic explanation of these three facts. And the other simple fact is that any naturalistic explanation, no matter how implausible, is infinitely more plausible than a supernatural explanation. Well, and of course the fact that these three facts are not actually undisputed facts. The explanation given by the original eyewitnesses is that God raised Jesus from the dead. How do you know that? Did anyone talk to the original eyewitnesses? Aside from Paul, no. We have no record of what their explanation for anything would have been. And with Paul, we have a description that is consistent with a hallucination. If it's even possible that God exists, then that explanation cannot be ruled out. Well, then I'd invite you to head over to my video where I argue that it is not possible for the Christian God to exist. But that aside, as long as we're just allowed to pull potential explanations out of our butt and say that they can't be ruled out, therefore they're more plausible than naturalistic explanations, then the flying spaghetti monster did it. Leprechauns tricked the disciples into believing that he came back. Jesus wasn't the son of God, he was a lich. And so on and so forth. Just because it cannot be conclusively ruled out by virtue of the fact that it's completely unfalsifiable does not mean that it is actually a plausible explanation. For a God who is able to create the entire universe, the odd resurrection would be child's play. And for a lich who is able to bind his soul to his dead body in order to reanimate it and attain eternal life while possessing the power of necromancy, coming back from the dead would be child's play. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Mr. JH, who says, Is there a switch back to Monday and Friday videos, or is this a one-off? We'll see. I'm trying to get back to two videos a week, but I'm not ready to make any promises yet. Maybe I'll alternate weeks in which I do two videos for a while and ramp my way back up to two videos every week. Thanks for watching, thanks to this week's PayPal hero Charles, and special thanks as always to my patrons, Clench Eastwood, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, and all the rest, who are the disciples who converted the apostles that are my channel. If you'd like to be unclear about what I mean when I refer to you with that word, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time!